Welcome to Ocean Stories, a podcast hosted by me, Lydia Carey, and me, Sarah Hersping. We may not be marine experts or even professional scuba divers, but we are curious about the ocean and ways to protect it. Every week, we chat with conservationists, researchers, business owners, and anyone else with an ocean story to tell. So whether you're a scientist or someone who's simply curious about the big blue, you're in the right spot. We can't save the seas alone, but we can do it together. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Ocean Stories. How are we doing? Welcome back. So good. Look what I'm, how I'm sitting here. I'm just trying to catch the last cell. I'm in the Christmas spirit. I'm feeling jolly and holy. I'm <laughs> feeling holy. <laughs> Everything is great. How are you? I'm good. I saw a post that said, in less than a week, the days will start getting longer. And I thought that was such a glass halfway, ha- a glass half full way. To look a glass at. halfway through. <laughs> <laughs> you get what I'm saying. It's a positive way to look at the days because the earlier sunset time is definitely affecting me. Yeah, December 22nd, baby. It's the shortest day. I wonder if the that's solstice. the shortest day everywhere. Yeah, right. That must be. I wonder if we have podcast listeners from down under. If you're from the Southern Hemisphere, raise your hand. Let Still, us know in the comments. Just- <laughs> it still sometimes blows my mind that there's just summer Christmas for some people, but good for them, honestly. Yeah, I was um, in Australia last year for Christmas and oh, it was true, wonderful. I remember. I would do it every year. Everyone's like, that's going to feel so weird. I think it's because I'm not emotionally attached to winter at all. Like, I don't need like to feel cozy with the snow or anything. So I loved it. And shout out to my Australian family. They're amazing. They do barbecue, we ate oh, mangoes. See? So it was Where awesome. in Australia? Sydney, right? They're in Sydney, yeah. A shout out again. My aunt and uncle, they swim every morning in at the beach, in the ocean, obviously. And it's reminded me a lot on this podcast talking about people swimming with sharks and stuff. I don't know. It just It's really scary. And I think it takes a lot of bravery to do that. Yeah. For sure. Didn't you say that that's you in 2024? Just exposing your vision board for 2024 here. Well, I've always been super intrigued by the idea of open water swimming. And when people do it in groups, it definitely appeals to me because I think I'd be less afraid and I'd be forced Mm. to just go with the group. But they, people that swim every day, they really do say it helps your, your mental health. So that's part of why it intrigues me because I just feel so good when I'm swimming. So I'm like, if I'm doing it every day, plus I'm facing my fears, I think I'd feel like on top of the world. But I'm and I've, really scared. Like, I'm really like there's, scared. <laughs> there's people that are, like, swimming out a little bit, and then they're kind of, like, swimming parallel to the shore, where I'm like, that, to me, sounds doable in some way, because if you're just getting really exhausted, you can turn around, or if, if something's scary. But the people that are doing these crazy crossings, and they're just, like, two miles out in the open ocean with their little balloon, I'm like, what if you have a cramp? You literally are just going to sink to the bottom. Like, I don't understand. I give major kudos and props to those people that are swimming every day because I wish it was me. And who knows? Maybe it will be me in 2024. You guys, 2024, if you are in the Southern California area and you want to start an open water swimming group with us, let us know. That would be so fun. a group, even better. We'll just join one that's already... That yeah, exists. I don't know if I'm confident enough yet to lead other people into the water, <laughs> like, but I'd be super so happy to join a, a group. So let me know. I feel like this topic is weirdly almost relevant to our today's topic, swimming in the ocean, because if you were swimming in the ocean in Australia, in San Diego, wherever the sun's shining, you would need to be aware of the sunscreen that you are using for various reasons. And that's what we're talking about today. Yeah, I feel like that's how the idea for this episode started, was you being like, I'm really interested in reef safe sunscreen brands this idea started because if you go in the ocean every day your hair is gonna suffer a lot and then hairdressers in san diego tell everyone to put conditioner in their hair before they go into the ocean and i'm like conditioner must be so toxic like the feeling of that that you get on your fingers and on your hair after you put conditioner in like the silky thing and i think most of them are literally just pure plastic that goes around your hair 
And I heard that from like so many people. And I was like, that just cannot be a good option at all. Like no way. And then I actually posted about it on TikTok and then people recommended Stream to See, which is the brand that's on our podcast today. Um, and they have this amazing leave-in conditioner. So now we are always using the leave-in conditioner before we surfing and my hair has never been better. So that was kind of how I first stumbled across this whole thing because of all the hairdressers telling people to go in the ocean with conditioner in the hair. Please don't do that. That is It's super horrible. popular. That's popular in Mallorca too. Everyone puts in leave-in conditioner from Mercadona before they go in and after they get out. And I've even done that too. I think it's like you don't even think about how the chemicals and what you put on yourself, like why would they be bad for the ocean if you're putting them on your body? Then we find out in today's episode, we find out the <laughs> truth. We learn more okay. about it. <laughs> we will learn more about that. And yeah, same with same with sunscreen. I feel like I got more aware of it and it's actually shocking how especially in the summer and in Mallorca too, you can see the shimmer on top of the water, which is just yes, literally oil. just oil product in the ocean and the whole ocean is covered this very interesting topic and we had a crazy conversation with mike from stream to see about how all the beauty products not only affect the ocean but also humans because yeah it makes so much sense like if if sunscreen and all these hair products affect the ocean so much it makes sense that to some degree it would affect humans too because we're we're also just living living little beings on this planet if after listening to this, you feel intrigued by Stream to See, you want to adopt better practices, better products for yourself, for the environment, for the ocean, then we have a discount code for you. We're super excited to work with Stream to See, so stay tuned until the end of the episode to hear the code. And we will also share it on Instagram. Today, we are talking sunscreen and other products with Mike. He is the executive vice president of Stream to See. He is from Hawaii, and he is super passionate about getting the toxic stuff out of our products. Welcome, Mike, to the podcast. How are you? Thank you so much. I'm doing very well. How are you two? We're great. We have two recordings today, so I feel like we're feeling super chatty and just yeah. ready to learn more about you and your life. Our first question for you is, where are you in the world right now? Where am I? I am in Orcas Island, Washington. Very different. Just came back from the New Orleans dive show and then drove a Sprinter van through incredibly cold winter weather all the way here for Thanksgiving. Maybe I'm just a novice, but are, is it Orcas Island or is that a hopeful no, wish? No, it's a total hopeful wish. It was actually based on uh, a family name. It's not even about the whales. Although okay. I have, I, had to I ask. have done, some, <laughs> yeah. Well, I've done some pretty extensive studies with groups here on these whales, and I can tell stories about those too. I mean, it's really interesting. And somehow, it's just named Orcas Island. <laughs> it was actually a, a family's name. It didn't have anything to do with the whales. Hmm. Yeah. The more you know. <laughs> That's what we're going to get into here. We're going to get into the more you know and scare the heck out of people, hopefully, but give them yeah. the solution at the same time. When you yeah. guys start to glaze over and you're thinking that everything is doom and gloom, stop me because I have certain stories that I can plug in about all the hope and good that's happening. So We for sure need the hope and good. So you grew up on Hawaii, is that correct? I remember you telling me a story flying over to Hawaii years and years, yes. and, years and years ago. Yes, I actually am um, like ninth or 10th generation Hawaiian. You can't tell by my skin color, but that's something that got me into stream to see two things. Um, very specifically, I grew up in Hanama Bay. My uncle was a UH uh, University of Hawaii um, researcher. So we were in Hanama Bay taking tests and all sorts of things all the time. I mean, I was there multiple times a month. When I was a kid, there were so many fish in Hanama Bay that you couldn't walk into the water up to your knees without getting run into by them. They couldn't get out of your way fast enough. That's how packed with fish the place was. When I took my daughters back about 15 years ago, my eldest, who's very precocious, said, Dad, this is an incredible hike, beautiful bay. Why did we bring our mask and snorkel? 
She had been in the water for 15 minutes and hadn't seen fish and wanted to know what the deal was because I was explaining my youth practically brought me to tears because I can't duplicate it for him, right? And it comes down to the fact that up to 6,000 visitors a day, I'm trying to even get away from the term tourist because there's a visitor that doesn't do damage and then there's a tourist that's there to just take advantage, right? And so I'm hoping that people are going to be visitors moving forward. But the idea that 6,000 people a day getting into the water, one drop of oxybenzone or two drops of avobenzone, which is a normal chemical for sunscreen, is enough to kill coral larvae in six Olympic-sized swimming pools. So picture, we're talking about one drop gets you to 62 parts per trillion. What does 6,000 people a day do? It gets it to about 29,800 parts per trillion. So the coral cannot reproduce in that bay. And it's so bad that a number of the fish like the parrotfish, the wrasse, the moray eels, a lot of the fish that start off female and need to convert to male, there's actually too much estrogen in the water. So there's a parrotfish that was trying to convert for three years in Hanama Bay, and the most it could do was get about halfway between female and male. So that was one reason that I got involved with Stream to Sea. The other was about 20 years ago, my thyroid stopped working. And it wasn't in my genetic lineage. It didn't make a lot of sense for it to happen. And I spent a whole bunch of time and a whole bunch of money with a Canadian doctor, went to a bunch of different doctors, but finally a Canadian doctor spent six weeks going through my history. And that's why I bring up the Hawaiian part, because I was the first generation of Hawaiians to swim in my family. And I look at that and go, what? You people live on an island. There's an ocean all the way around you. And they didn't go in the water. That was just not something that they did. So I was the first generation. My parents used to drop us off at the beach and say, just stay inside the reef. So about every hour, I would be putting on more sunscreen because according to this doctor, the thing that killed my thyroid was the fact that I didn't get the skin color. I got sturdy bones and wide feet. Thank you, Hawaiian blood. That's great. <laughs> I was really good at football, low center of gravity, but it didn't help me in the sun. So the fact that I had sunscreen multiple times a day and then showered multiple times a day, he said the environmental toxin that triggered your thyroid to fail was actually your sunscreen and your body care products because he didn't find anything else, right? I wasn't a farmer or um, they didn't work in a printer factory or smelting metal or anything like that. So it turns out that it was that. So that's my motivation and that's what got us here. So you want to talk about a really long tangent to get back to answering your question? There it is. <laughs> no, That's... I mean, those are the stories. Those are the stories that brought you to these realizations. It's important. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, I watch, you know, the Hawaiian landscape just get completely changed, especially the underwater landscape. It's happening on the land there too. They're losing a whole bunch of species because it's such a terrific place to grow stuff and test stuff. So a lot of the chemical companies actually have been using the Hawaiian islands to test pesticides, herbicides, all sorts of different things because they can grow stuff really quickly. And that's incredibly frustrating for somebody who absolutely loves that piece of land. Mm -hmm. I feel like you've already touched on so many things. You bringing your daughters back and there are no fish in the sea anymore. You grew up with like all the fish in such a short time of humankind so much changed so quickly and I like that's one thing that just scares me a lot is like okay if we have kids one day it ch everything changes so fast and I can already like see so many things vanish in front of my own eyes and like plastic pollution everywhere like beaches that used to be clean are now polluted too and all those kind of things like it's it's a good motivation to protect our planet for our future generations and yeah it's so sad that you were so affected sure. by it. You already told us a little bit about toxins in sunscreen. Toxins get into the water. Fish, did I understand correctly that the paired fish is female and then it's trying to become male? Can you explain a little bit about like how all of that is connected? Because I'm sure. a little bit lost. <laughs> sure. No, that's quite all right. So it turns out that according to Sorbonne University out of France, 82% of every body care product on the planet contains estrogen and endocrine disruptors. 
Okay, so they're not on the label necessarily. If something says fragrance, remember that term, everybody says, watch out for synthetic fragrances, but nobody tells you how to tell if it's a synthetic fragrance or not, right? Or, or what does that mean? And why are we afraid of them? They just say, watch out for them, but they don't give you the background. So it turns out that a sunscreen is considered an over-the-counter drug, right? So on a sunscreen, if you have a chemical, it has to be on the label. If it's a body care product, right? Any body care product, I'm talking about makeup, lotion, you know, whatever. I mean, sun, not sunscreen, sunscreen's the over counter drug. Um, shampoo, conditioner, all these different things, they have perfume or fragrance in them. If you have that on the label, the FDA allows 3,000 chemicals under the name perfume or fragrance. And of those, hundreds of them are estrogen or estrogen mimickers. Hundreds of them are endocrine disruptors. And it turns out at this point, according to um, some of the studies we've seen, it could be up to a quarter of those are potential carcinogens. And they're all in the body care products, right? So the FDA has actually acknowledged a number of these things, like one chemical, you know, Hawaii Band 2 chemicals. One of the ones they replaced it with is octocrylene. Octocrylene, when you put it into a tube, you put it on a shelf for a couple of months, it degrades into benzophenone, which is a carcinogen that's been banned for a couple of decades in this country because it's so harsh for the human body. And the FDA acknowledges this is true. Within 30 minutes of putting that shampoo or lotion or whatever on your body, in your urine, there is estrogen that's too high for humans. There's endocrine disruptors that's too high for humans. And there's carcinogens that are too high for humans. And the last I heard, the FDA said, we're going to give the manufacturers 12 months to figure out how to fix this problem. That was 21 months ago. Hmm. Nothing's happened. All 13,000 products still contain octocrylene. And so most of these chemicals, that's what it comes down to, right? So if you look at those fish that start out as female, typically it's the strongest or the biggest that converts to male during breeding time. So there's usually one male with, I, I guess the name would be a harem of female fish around in that area. If that male gets eaten or dies, then the largest or the strongest female typically converts to male to be able to breed during that time. If there's too much of those petrochemicals in the water at that time, they can't convert, right? So we're actually slowing down the reproduction of fish. Now, interestingly enough, humans are having the same problem, right? So right now, um, our fertility is 61% worse than it was 21 years ago. And you actually hear this all the time. You just don't hear it that way. Okay, so what you hear is every country on the planet is aging out faster than they're being born. And they look at it from an economic standpoint. They keep saying, we're going to have a big cash problem. What they're missing is it's a humanity problem. Like right now, a quarter of everybody that wants to get pregnant has to be medically assisted. Right. That didn't used to be the case. When I was a kid, you never heard anyone say they were trying to get pregnant. Everybody was trying not to. We were way fertile, right? And so you didn't want to have kids until you wanted to have kids. If instead of talking about the economy, they would say, hey, Dr. Shanna Swan estimates by the year 2050 that the human race will actually be functionally extinct because we won't have enough fertility. The same year, she says 2.4 billion people on the planet are going to starve because the fish fertility is going to be in the same situation. Okay, I'm already seeing Lydia freak out here. <laughs> I'm upset. I have to tell you, I'm upset. First of all, parrotfish is the coolest thing. That's the coolest evolutionary thing I ever heard. Second of all, this is crazy stuff. I mean, it's upsetting right? stuff. Right. And so this is why it's so important to me, right? I, two Dimas ago, uh, the Dima Dive Show, they don't allow kids in under 15. And three 15-year-old girls and a 16-year-old boy walked up to our booth. And I talked to them about all of this stuff for about 25 minutes. And one of the girls said, hey, everybody else seems to be blowing us off. 
you know, I look at your name tag and it says you're the vice president of a company. Why are you spending so much time talking to us? And I said, here's the deal. What I know from Marketing 101 is that the average woman can see something three times, remember that she's seen it, recognize the name, and maybe even know what it was, what the brand was. The average male needs to see it 12 to 15 times just to be able to acknowledge that he's ever seen it before. I said, so it's really important to me. And what I want to know from the three of you is what are you going to do based on the information that I just told you? And every one of them reacted like Lydia. I'm angry. I need to make changes. I'm going to tell all my friends. I'm going to tell the people that own the stores. There's a dive shop down the road from me that's carrying something that's super toxic and I need to tell them about it. And I turned to the 16 year old boy and I said, wow, they had a really long list. What's your plan based on what you've heard? And he said, uh, wait, so if I use the wrong sunscreen, I don't need to use birth control. That's what he got out of it, right? Oh, and so, that's cracking me up. <laughs> isn't that fun? I'm like, oh, great. I'm like, don't worry. Most guys catch up in the next nine or 10 years. He, he could mature. It'll be fine. And he'll hear more. But between now and then, don't commit with this guy, right? <laughs> and they oh, all just shook their head. Oh, my goodness gracious. <laughs> right? But he wasn't wrong, right? According to Dr. Craig Downs, if you use the wrong shampoo, conditioner, sunscreen three times in a week, it's the equivalent of having a low dose estrogen birth control in your system. Hmm. The UK just announced 20 chemicals, most of them in body care products that cause breast cancer, right? So there's a lot of reasons for women to be really pissed right now. And this is one they don't even know about yet. They're being marketed and told what they need to look like, how they need to act, what their makeup and all this sort of stuff from all of these celebrities that are really just making a ton of money off of it. And what it's really doing is supporting the medical industry because endometriosis, Hirschsprung's disease, breast cancer, all of these things are being linked to these chemicals. And then we're going to have to go get the anecdote, you know, the, the antidote from pharmaceutical companies. And that to me is just sad. Yeah. it That is just so upsetting. And I don't know. I recently downloaded this this app. It's called Yucca, I believe. Uh -huh. And you can scan all your products. And I've, I'm just like scanning everything that goes into this house at the moment. Everyone thinks I'm a freak. But it's it's so scary, especially like in shampoos. You already get like the, oh, this is an all natural, whatever the hell product. And the list is still like eight warnings. And it's always endocrine disruptors. Like in everything and then i literally scanned the entire cvs i kid you not i was in that store for three hours scanning every label in that store and i was, I was so upset and then exactly what you said i was like okay i literally feel like i need to go to all of my friends and tell them exactly what's going on i was like you need to do download this app right now like yeah. it's just so overwhelming it's like one of these things that's so overwhelming and one thing that you just said it's like we always talk about everything from the perspective of like economics and like oh yeah if this happens then then we can't make money anymore or if this happens then i'm like no we're talking about humans and humankind and the planet like if we don't fix this base layer then we can't play our little monopoly game anymore that we're playing every day like it's just right oh uh, well, the bummer about it and, and yuka is a very good app and there's a couple of them that are good like that um, that, that help you with what the label says. Now here's the royal bummer. There's cross contaminations because there's very, very few companies that manufacture in their own facility and control their supply chain. So my understanding is the protect land and sea certification that Dr. Craig Downs did only five sunscreens have been able to pass that so far, but what he found is there were more than a hundred brands that tried to pass the protect land and sea certification. None of them had really bad chemicals on the list or they wouldn't have tried because they knew these things were not allowed, but only five out of over a hundred could pass. And it's because they were cross-contaminated. 
So to give you an idea, we used to have somebody make our lip balms for us. And about one shipment every nine months, we could actually sell because we do third party testing on all of our products to make sure that it still passes our aquatic toxicity tests and they wouldn't. So our formula was correct and it was fine, but either cleaning products or in other products that were cross contaminating with ours in the factory, we couldn't pass those tests. So that's pretty significant, right? And there's no way to know. I mean, I mean, oh. I think part of it too is we have the businesses like Stream to Sea, which I'd love if you could talk more about in a minute about your journey with that. There's businesses that are making the effort out of the own goodness of their hearts, right? Their own morals and their values that they care about the ocean and that they care about humans and all of this. But then there's the systems of the FDA and all of this that make it really hard for people, even when you know even when you know, it's really hard. Ignorance is bliss, right? And you go to the store, it's Christmas, there's deals on a chapstick set. A little girl wants the lip smackers, lip balms. You know, I think it's frustrating when you do know, but it can feel defeating when you go to the store and it's every product has some carcinogen in it. And that's what I like yeah. about this issue, like at its basic level, chemicals in our stuff, right? It's it's reminding me that we are the environment. We are not separate from nature. It's hurting nature. It's hurting the fish, the reefs, and the ocean, right? Ocean stories. But it's also hurting us. Like, it's really hurting us. And, like, we right. need to catch on to, well, to that connection. Yeah, we're all connected. And it's it's so synergistic or, or the opposite, right? I mean, it can be so defeating. So... I had an intern that worked for us at one point that worked for NOAA and NASA. So anytime they were doing an ocean experiment in space, she was the go-between. And she said, what do you do when somebody doesn't understand that about 70% of the oxygen for the planet comes from the ocean and between 30 and 50% of the carbon sequestration? Everybody thinks it's trees. Trees are great, but they don't do near as much as the ocean does. And then they don't understand that damaging the reef which is the nursery for the ocean, ends up causing this global problem and it ends up hurting humanity. She said, somebody lives in Missouri. They're not next to the, a reef. What do you say to them? And I said, well, it's kind of embarrassing because I end up talking to them about their hormones. And she said, oh, wait, let me stop you right there. She said, do you know that the National Hockey League had the cup as a mandatory part of the uniform 100 years before the helmet. They valued their genitals more than their brains, right? So she said, if it's going to save the planet, if you're going to save humanity, if you're going to save the, the ocean by talking about people's junk, because that's more important to them than the reef, do it. So now I'm not afraid of it anymore, right? We just throw it out there. That's how connected everything is. If the fish fertility is dropping at a similar rate to humans, it's all connected. The stuff that's harming them seems to take a little bit longer to harm humans because we've got a great medical system and the fish don't, right? So mm. all of these things are very, very synergistic and very connected. And before you get too dark, <laughs> I want to tell you a quick little story because I got to throw these in know, wherever like, we can. I'm like, where are the, where's those positive stories? Like, tell me about right. the change you're making to the industry right. and all of that. <laughs> please, please pull me out of the darkness. So there is a river in British Columbia, which is probably only about 30 miles from where I'm sitting right now. It's called the Cowichan River and they rent inner tubes. Well, it turns out three years ago, they had hit their fourth year of zero salmon hatch. The salmon were coming back, they were laying their eggs and none of them were viable, right? So you didn't get a, a salmon hatch at all. They blame the guy who's renting inner tubes. They said it must be the sunscreen and the body care products from these people because a scientist went out there, tested the eggs, just one guy in his garage, tested the eggs, found body care chemicals in all these eggs. Said, I don't know if that's what's causing the problem, but I can't guess that it's helping. Right. So this guy, I find him right before the news comes back to interview him, train him up on all this stuff. And he does a beautiful job of saying, this is what we're doing, right? This is why we're doing it. Stream to see is the only 
brand of mineral sunscreen and body care products on the planet that's been tested and proven not to harm humans, fish, C. elegans, and coral larvae. And I love bringing up C. elegans because they share 70% of human DNA. And they're like the canary in the coal mine. They're these little sea worms. And they do a lot of tests for different diseases and medications on them because they're going to die really quickly if something's bad. And that means that humans would die more slowly. So he says, this is what we're going to do. You can't rent an inner tube. You can't use our shuttle buses. We won't allow you on the river. We will physically bar you from it. It's all trespassing. We will prosecute if you go around us. And when you rent your inner tube, we're going to give you a stream to see for free. Pretty cool, right? Guys committed. End of the first season, they have the largest salmon hatch they've had in two decades. All we did was take some poison out. We didn't fix ocean acidification, climate change, anything. We took some poison out of the water and the fish went, yeah, we can do that, right? We can come back. This is now the third season that this has been going on. And in the history of the Cowichan River, the First Nations people of Canada are saying they have never seen this many salmon on this river as far back as they can, they can link it to. So all we did was change one thing. Nature doesn't need a bunch. And nature is used to adapting, right? So it wasn't like it was 30 years ago in that river, but the salmon are thriving because we took the poison out. So to me, that gives me a lot of hope. We can change this quickly. COVID proved that, right? Take a bunch of people out and the sharks in Guam were, were breeding along the shore and in the harbors where they hadn't ever seen that before, right? Take the people out of the equation. Take their chemicals out of the equation. The frustrating part to me is if you watch the money, right? So petrochemical companies own chemical companies, own plastic companies, own pharmaceutical companies, own body care companies, own herbicide, pesticide companies. And they're all very similar chemicals. So if you look at the first year in 1954, we were told to wear sunscreen. It's a Monsanto patented herbicide that's the base for oxybenzone and avobenzone, the two chemicals that they're most prevalent in using on sunscreens. And you're going, an herbicide? How did that work? Well, it blocked the, the sun from the plant so it couldn't do photosynthesis. Then somebody said, hey, what if we put it into plastic, right? Because plastic is fading in the sun. What if we put it into plastic? Yep, it actually works. A 1982 Honda Civic wagon, the dashboard cracked and all the bumpers where it was black and plastic turned gray, right? All the way up until about 2006, I think that would happen. Now they don't turn gray. They stay black. It's a Monsanto patented herbicide that's in the plastic. Then somebody said, what happens if we put it into the bottle? Because a lot of them get sun damage and the stuff in the bottle in shampoo or conditioner or whatever, it starts to de degrade. Okay, let's put it in that. And it worked. It kept it more shelf stable. And then they said, what if we put it on the human body? Yep. Stops you from getting sunburn. But all of those things are estrogen and endocrine disruptors and have never been approved by the FDA as generally regarded safe and effective. The only sunscreen that has is a mineral sunscreen, right? So you look at that and go, hmm, the FDA has the ability to request a voluntary recall, but that's the whole power of the FDA over a body care product. The last time we had a, a requested recall, there was they tested 278 brands of sunscreen and found benzene, a carcinogen, in them. They requested 78 of them. Please recall your product. Seven of them came off the market. Hundreds of them a year are requested to come off the market, and very few ever do, and nobody knows about it. Oh, wow. like mind blown. <laughs> But you see the salmon, right? Somehow I took the happy part and turned it into super dark. Okay, but but <laughs> let's go but, back. Salmon, go back to the salmon. They came back, right? I mean, that's how important this is. And they're noticing the same sort of thing with the reef, you know, in different areas. If you have oxybenzone in the water, 
the reef will start to bleach at 27 degrees Celsius. If you don't have oxybenzone or abobenzone in the water, it doesn't start to bleach until over 30 degrees Celsius. How cool, right? I mean, we can fix the problem. We already have. We just need to get the word out there and get people to stop using the other stuff. I mean, I love how passionate you are about Stream to Sea and all of the certifications and things you've been able to do as a company. It makes me wonder why haven't other companies also done this? Like, what what do you think is the reason that is it money? Is it all of these connections to the big corporations that's stopping the brands from using these? What's the deal? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so I would have to guess. I don't know how they sleep at night, but I know that we can't <laughs> if we harm anything, right? And so for us, it's very simple. You you test it. You make sure that everything that you put out is absolutely as safe as you can humanly possibly create. With the other companies, my guess would be either they don't know, which is my hope, right? That they're just ignorant to it. But more likely, it is a profit-motivated thing. And the chemicals are very, very cheap, right? So if you look at a stream to sea product, instead of using the chemicals, we're using expensive minerals, we're using antioxidants, we're using all sorts of things that are safe for fish and humans and actually beneficial to most environments. And it costs us a lot of money, right? It is not the same sort of profit margin that most of these companies are going after but we're on a very different trajectory, right? And we're trying to stop the current trajectory of the planet. And to that end, Autumn, our cosmetic chemist, herbalist, amazing, um, you know, hall of fame diver, just an incredible person. She can formulate almost anything you want in about a week and it'll be super clean and really good at what it does. Um, the two of us just started taking salaries right? We're our lowest paid employees. She's been at it nine years. I've been with her for seven, right? So this is not about we want to drive Ferraris. It's about we want the planet to survive. I mean, I don't, you can edit it out if you want, or I can censor myself right now. But there was a comedian from a long time ago, George Carlin, that said that everybody is worried about the planet, he said, I'm not worried about the planet at all. It's the humans that are bleep. <laughs> They're screwed, right? I mean, and that was still censored. But he's saying as soon as the planet dies, I mean, as soon as the humans die, the planet will come back very quickly. And my preference would be to be part of that, part of the solution, and see it. I would love to see Hanama Bay the way that it was when I was a kid, right? I don't know that that's going to happen in my lifetime, but there's proof that if we do this sort of work, it can come back, right? We're seeing it in different places. And that's why some of our profits go to things like reef renewal, where we planted 10,000 corals and then the temperature got too hot and some of those started to die. So we had to go and move them. So they were deeper in the water and, you know, all these different things, but it can be done. And I think that's one of the things that's so frustrating to me is a lot of these things that we thought were real are actually money motivated and marketing money motivated. You're both too young to remember there was a, a, a Native American looking person on the side of a freeway with a whole bunch of litter around and he had a tear rolling down his eyes. Well, it turned out that he wasn't a Native American. He was an actor and he was actually paid for by the Plastic Manufacturers Association because they were trying to get people to understand that it wasn't plastic that was the problem. It was the consumer that was littering that was the problem, right? They paid for that. I think somebody paid for the term climate change. If they had said human safety, who's going to argue with that? But climate change gave a lot of room for argument. And then you pay different influencers to say different things, and then it divides the populace. So some I mean, people that think that is literally what happened. It's crazy. Right? Isn't it? And my belief, I have no proof for this. I'll be the first to admit that. But my belief is the reason that we are hearing about sunscreens and everybody going after reef safe sunscreens is actually subterfuge so we don't go after the body care products. Everybody mm. showers, 
uses makeup, uses deodorant, uses all these different things. Not everybody uses sunscreen. So I think it's the sacrificial lamb. Let's just go after sunscreen because there's not as much profit margin in it as there is in everything else. But it's coming. Eventually, somebody's going to blow the whistle. Maybe your audience, somebody in the audience is going to go, what? Shut up. My shampoo, right? We didn't, this is like I was, I was saying, we tend to make something when we can't find one that's safe. Um, mask defog, you know, for, for divers and goggles and all that sort of stuff, the defogger agent. Most people are using baby shampoo or dish soap as their defogging agent. If you put two drops of a traditional cheap baby shampoo into a 20 gallon aquarium, 90% of everything in the aquarium will die within a couple of hours. And everything that's really, really hardy, it'll take about two weeks before it starves to death. But everything will eventually die when exposed to those sort of surfactants and chemicals. So we made a mass defog so that it wouldn't do that. And it's just amazing to me that people are willing to continue that. I have so many thoughts on all of this. First of all, I just get so angry at at the concept of money but that's that's too big to get into like just what what do you just explain everything's, in general. Always, <laughs> everything's always about profit and you guys found the solution and then you were literally working for free for seven years but i don't know i feel like we always spend money on the wrong things but that's like a whole different topic now i lost my lo now i lost my train of thought no it's really important sarah because here's the thing the companies can't continue to rape and pillage the planet if the consumers are not willing to pay for it. And that's really why I'm willing to talk to three 15 year old girls and a 16 year old boy at a trade show for a half an hour. Because if two drops of baby shampoo kills everything in a 20 gallon aquarium, what happens with all those hundreds of thousands of bottles of stuff that everybody's using? So literally those three girls, if they went and changed to stream to see, and the boy might change in another 10 years, but literally, if they change what they're using in their shampoo, it's saving lives, right? It may be their own, but it may be the fish down the stream, right? Or whatever. And that's why the name Stream to Sea, because all of it eventually leads to the ocean. And between here and there, it does a bunch of damage, right? One more marketing term, biodegradable. Biodegradable means that it'll break down in sewage sludge in a wastewater treatment plant. It does not mean that it's non-toxic, and so a lot of people are taking these soaps that say biodegradable and they're washing in a lake or in a stream or something like that. It could kill everything in the stream. It's only in sewage sludge that it's tested. So all of our products were tested originally to be non-toxic, right? So it's not going to cause any problems for anything, even if you dump it right into the water. If you then look at the biodegradability, we tested it in fresh water and salt water, which we had to pay the lab extra to do because they'd never done it. They just know how to do it in sewage sludge. So we know exactly how many hours it takes for everything to break down. But back to your money point, we need to vote with our money, right? When it comes to this sort of stuff, we have to vote with our money. And you asked earlier why other companies hadn't done it. I think a lot of it's profit, but... Nine years ago, when Autumn started this, we were the only ones that could say that we passed this test. And nine years later, we're still the only ones that can pass this test. And that, to me, is the biggest frustration. Because what we do, we're, we're, not, we're not hogging it. You know, Autumn is an amazing formulator and is happy to formulate products for other people. She was actually in the island of Palau when they went to ban 13 different chemicals. The cool part about it is Palau decided they were going to make their own sunscreen because when you go to Palau, you have to watch a video on the airplane and then they stamp your passport with a Palau pledge and you have to sign off that this is how I'm going to treat the environment while I'm here. And you learned all about it in the half hour video on the plane. How cool, right? They're trying to protect it for the next generation. So when you sign that, you say any of these things, if I violate it, I'm going to pay a thousand dollar fine. Now, they created the Palau Pledge SPF 30 sunscreen. And down at the bottom, it says made by stream to sea because we're the only ones that could provide the science for them to make sure that they actually are doing what needs to happen. 
So there's places like that. And, and Palau has decided our environment for our future generations is more important than having a lot of visitors, right? So if people don't want to pay for it, they actually banned, I believe, China and Japan from fishing in their waters because they didn't want their sharks taken and all this sort of stuff. And because of that, both China and Japan stopped granting visas to visit Palau. And China and Japan were their biggest visitors. So they just decided to sacrifice the money to save their environment. That's cool. Right? And so that's, that's why we have these sort of discussions. Because every time you get somebody to change something, then the corporate world looks at it. Goes, wait, where did that money go? Right? One lip balm at a time. One shampoo at a time. I mean, it is a huge recurring theme on this podcast is voting with your dollar, as well as having conversations with people. I think a lot of people have no idea about this sort of stuff, me included, 40 minutes ago or whenever we started recording. And I also think it's really difficult. It's difficult to access these products if you don't know about this type of thing. You would have never known stream to see existed. You would have never known about these chemicals or this app that Sarah's talking about. So I think it's also just having conversations with people to be like, look, I don't know all the science, but I know that there's some things that don't make sense. The chemicals in our stuff are killing the fish and we're not fish, but we're also not invincible. <laughs> so right. from a basic logic level, it checks out to me, you know? And yeah. And look at the science, right? To me, there is science that is, you know, not refutable, right? I mean, this is just, here's the facts. You put that one in the water and you can actually go to our YouTube channel and see that. Somebody made a video of 10 fish in, you know, in each aquarium, you know, 10 fish in a 10 gallon aquarium, three aquariums. One had streamed to sea, one had a competitor, one was a control group. And you can watch what happens. Right. It's horrifying. It takes a bit of time, but it's horrifying to be an aquatic toxin. Everything in that aquarium would have to die within 96 hours. Well, 30 percent of them died in 96 hours and they don't call that an aquatic toxin because fish are replaceable. Psh, they're just fish. They die quickly. Right. But everything in that tank died within two weeks. And that's not called an aquatic toxin because it wasn't fast enough, right? So who created that? Was that an EPA thing? Is there somebody that's paying for that? You know, I don't, I don't know. I don't have those answers, but there's so many things to me that are cash motivated that once again, the consumer has to be the one that just says, no, we're not going to buy that. We're going to buy this. And when you talk to your friends, you don't have to have all of the science. You just say that this company does, right? They've already done all the testing to make sure that it doesn't harm humans, C. elegans, coral larvae, and fish, and they can prove it. You know, we had this river, we had this, you know, whatever, and everybody else, I don't know, right? And I still have to say the same thing because looking at somebody's label, I go, wow, those look like really good ingredients, but I can't actually tell you what's in it unless I take it to a lab and test it. Mm -hmm. right? Or can that, that company, because most of them are made in just a few different manufacturing facilities. And that's how a lot of our food is. If you ever look at, and that's a great correlation for me. If you ever look at a package of food, how many times does it say manufactured in a facility with soy, wheat, gluten, peanuts, you know, all these different things on it. It doesn't say that in your body care products and it should manufactured in a facility with all of these allergens, all these toxins, all these different things. And by the way, we clean it with a cleaning agent that's a carcinogen and causes breast cancer and, you know, blah, blah, blah. It just goes on and on. And those chemicals are so insidious, like um, oxybenzone. We can't buy a kettle, right? They make, they make this stuff in a huge stainless steel kettle with a big, like, mixer in it. We can't buy one from a body care products company. If it was ever used for body care products, then it likely has oxybenzone and avobenzone still in it. 
the estimation from Dr. Craig Downs is it takes three and a half years to get oxybenzone out of stainless steel and rubber hoses. That's even cleaning it with all the detergents and agents and acids and all sorts of stuff. It just stays. So of course that's coming out in the products that are in the, those kettles. Right? Yeah. And I, I love the labels. I love people trying, but if you're not making it in your own fa facility, you don't know. You don't know what's in it. Damn. This is really, this is heavy stuff. And I do really like the, I mean, it's kind of sad that we have to focus on how it affects us humans to have people like be passionate about to make a cha change. Because I understand that, especially if you live landlocked, you're like, how is my sunscreen affecting anything here? But yeah, I really agree with um, what you just said before. Like if it takes talking about how it affects the human body and how your hormones are affected and everything. And that's the way that we can get closer to the solution at the end of the day, then that's what it takes. That's what we yeah. got to do. According to Dr. Shanna Swan, based on these petrochemicals, one third of every male child is being born with a micro penis because of these chemicals in the mom's system during a four hour window of the human gestational period. She's actually even linked it to the issue of body dysmorphia with gender fluidity and all sorts of different things going on. Because during that four hour window, if the child has an XY chromosome, meaning it should be a stereotypical male, um, you could end up with an XY chromosome and all female genitalia in a female brain. So yeah. People are coming out with body dysmorphia and she says, get ready. It's growing quickly. So I promised I would switch gears and here's the switch. The cool part about these products is typically you run into something that's good for humans or it's good for the environment or it's nice to use, right? All of our products are so cool to use. Right. And, and it's because autumn is such a good formulator that if it, if she can't make it good for the environment and super high performing, then she doesn't do it. So most sunscreens you get in the water and it starts to break down. So you might get into the water in an SPF 30, but by the time you get out, it's an SPF 10. Ours after 80 minutes has actually improved by 48%. And the SPF testers had never seen it. They thought it was magic. They had no idea. They ran five different tests for us. So not only is it super safe and clean and good for you and good for the environment, it's super high tech, right? And it really, oh, you'll, you'll love, there's a, I'm not cool enough for this one, but there's one that's a shimmer. Everybody wanted a glitter and we can't find a biodegradable glitter, not a hundred percent biodegradable. So we made one out of borosilicate, which is essentially sand that's been heated up and turned into glass. So your whole skin glitters like it's gold and you're not getting a sunburn. All the products are like that. Our shampoo's amazing. It's a great wetsuit wash. Who knew? I that People teach me this stuff all the time, what they use these products for. And to me, that's just really cool. I don't really need customers. I need advocates. Because if you try all of our products, you go... That was amazing, but you probably don't remember the name unless you understand the why, right? Mm -hmm. And that's what we're talking about. Here's the why. Mm -hmm. So on top of it, it's a great product. Heck, our, our, for oceans, gosh, the Sting Relief Gel, Autumn was, she's a rebreather diver. She was down there trying to get a fish to pose. At the 40-minute mark, the little turkey still hadn't posed correctly, and she brushed into fire coral. Fire coral changes your perspective on the world. That stuff hurts. <laughs> um, she's headed to the surface, right? And her indigenous dive master said, wait, wait, wait. Went underneath a brain coral, pulled some snotty stuff out, rubbed it on her arm and started counting. And by the time he got to 10, she didn't feel it. So that's what we put into our sting relief gel. We take those enzymes we put it into that sting relief gel. It's great for fire coral, Portuguese man of war, jellyfish, bug bites, anything that irritates your skin. Use it as an aftershave. Anytime you get these little rashes, plus it just smells great. It would be a good like potpourri sort of stuff. Just put it out on the counter. But yeah, <laughs> all of the products have those kind of hidden uses for them. And 
amazing. And I'll take a breath and you can ask a different question <laughs> because obviously the passion runs deep here and we just keep going when somebody wants to listen to it. No, it's lovely. We do have a final question. It's our question we ask everyone who comes onto the podcast and maybe it will be a, what's the word, melancholy moment for you because I'm not sure which, I don't know, I don't know if you will pick a story from your past or a story from right now. But the question is, what's your favorite ocean memory or story, your favorite ocean yeah. moment? No, see, I'm, I'm hopeful. And so, you know, we found the cure. We just need everybody to do it. Um, it was after Hanama Bay taking my daughters to Fiji. And being able to go snorkeling and diving and all sorts of stuff with them in Fiji. And the life, the reef, there's so many different types of coral. And what it looks like to me was my childhood, right? And probably even better than my childhood, better than Hanama Bay was 50 years ago, because I'm freaking old. So, yeah, Hawaii and the, the, the Hawaii-Fiji component being able to share that with my daughters and, and being able just to have that utter joy. And I think my secondary one would be my mother-in-law, 75 years old. We're in Curacao um, less than a year ago. And she had these tiny little fins on and loves going snorkeling. And she looked like she was struggling. And my wife and I, you know, swam over there as fast as we can to try to support her. And we're like, what's wrong? What's going on? She was literally crying because she'd never seen live coral like that. And she spent most of her childhood in Hawaii as well. And to me, I'm looking at that going, that's the sort of impact that the ocean can have on you. And I think you need to experience it so that you want to save it. Right. And to me, that's where the passion comes from. So, no, I, I'm not going to get melancholy on that. It's about... Um, you know, the, the potential is there and it's still in different parts of the world. You know, I, Curacao and Bonaire were amazing for that. Fiji's amazing for that. Um, Rajadampur, I've heard in Indonesia is like that. I haven't been there. Parts of the Red Sea. I think we can get them back there. It is going to take a concerted effort by the majority of the planet, right, to be able to pull that off. Thank you for listening to this episode with Mike. We hope that you enjoyed it and it also made you enraged like it enraged us. We're super excited to share that we're working with stream to see so we have a discount code to offer if you would like to buy or check out any of their products. They have sunscreen, body care, hair care. All of their products are packaged in environmentally friendly ways. And obviously, as you just heard, they have special formulations that are super safe for the environment and also super safe to put all over your body every single day of your life. So without further ado, our code is... Our code is Ocean Stories. One word and you will get 10% off all their products. We'll also share it on Instagram and probably do some more highlights of our favorite stream to see products in the future. So you can look forward to that. If you want to check out your products with this app that I mentioned, it is called Yuka, Y-U-K-A. It is for free. You can send them a donation though, because it's like an open source project. Um, and it's really good for food too. So not only for your skincare products, um, I use it a lot at Trader Joe's or anywhere else just to see what's in your food and what crazy preservatives are in a bunch of things. So um, yeah, it's actually quite fun. You just scan the code and it will tell you exactly what's in there. And it's actually a European app. So it gives you a lot of alternatives only on the European market though. I'm pretty sure there's a US one coming out too. If so, I'll link it in our Instagram. Well, thank you again to Mike. This was a bit of an abrupt ending, thanks to me stopping the recording accidentally. Um, it was such a great conversation and uh, it was amazing to learn about all these things. Also shocking, but yeah, again, thank you to Mike and to stream to see Thanks for joining us for another episode of Ocean Stories. If you'd like to follow along on Instagram, you can find us at oceanstories underscore podcast for updates and behind the scenes. 
We'll also be sharing our ocean adventures on YouTube at Ocean Stories Podcast. If you like this episode, please show your support by leaving a review on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. Join us next Tuesday for more Ocean Stories.